Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to Sunday worship at Ankeny United Church and ankenyucc.org. We are a welcoming church family, exploring progressive Christian theology, caring within and serving beyond. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are invited to walk with us on this morning. And that means whether this is your first time here, your 2,000th time here, or somewhere in between, you are welcome. Whether you are seeking to serve or need to be refreshed, both or neither, or somewhere in between, you are welcome here. Whether you are widowed, single, married, coupled, or somewhere in between, you are welcome here. Whether you are gay or straight, both or neither, or somewhere in between, you are welcome here. And children of all ages are always welcome to come as they are in our worship, and you are too. But we also have a staff nursery should you need it. This is the worship of God at Ankeny United Church and ankenyucc.org, and we are glad you are here. Now, please rise in body or spirit to join in our call to worship. Beloved community, let us assemble with purpose. In the presence of God, let us find grounding and renewal. We embrace the holy gift of joy, both personal and political. Joy connects us to each other. Joy calls us to build a better world. Joy keeps our hearts open and alive. A friend to righteous anger and determination. A companion in sorrow and struggle. Let us worship the one who is joy, for, for they sustain and uphold us. Please turn to our opening hymn, page 282 in the Black Hymnal, Every Time I Feel the Spirit. Please join me in the responsive reading of Living Psalm 114. Praise our Creator, O Miigwech, we give thanks to Maker. Love lives forever in our ancestors dancing in Aurora Borealis. Jerusalem, the mighty things of the Creator, or drum their praise. Joyful are those who observe justice, who work for right relations at all times. Remember me, O Great Spirit. When you show your, to your people, help me when you lead us to places of protection. 
I see the grateful hunting of creatures, the generous gathering and abundant harvest prosperity of our clans. May I dance in the ceremonies of our nation's people. May I have glory in the present and all. My friends, as we gather in prayer this morning, we are surrounded by images and stories in Israel and Gaza that are heartbreaking, devastating, and overwhelming. We must name how the murderous actions of terrorists are evil and inconsistent with any ethic of neighborly love. We hold our breath for what may come. We feel this grief this morning. Loving God, you are steadfast, forever enfolding even when we cannot accept ourselves. May your spirit empower us to imitate you by receiving those who feel judged and rejected, by walking alongside those who feel despair by encouraging those who tend to the broken, by affirming those who labor in love. We lift into your tender care those whose bodies, minds, or spirits have been weakened or crushed. We lift up to your compassionate grace those whose burdens, guilt, or fears seem just too massive to bear. We lift before your expansive mercy those whose hatred, rage, or vengeance cannot be contained. We pray, receive all these cares, loving God, and fill us with the light of Christ through the work of your spirit. Amen. Before we pause for some silent prayer this morning, I ask, are there any concerns or joys or whatever you'd like to lift up this morning. So prayers for the quality of his life and for the family perhaps to come together to provide that support that he needs. Yeah. Lord, hear our prayers. Anything else? Let's pause for a moment of silent prayer.
Let's pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The children are welcome to come forward. So, a little later, we're going to hear a scripture reading that talks about rejoicing, talks about what it's like to have joy in our lives. So, <laughs> this is the joy side. This is the not-so-joyful side. And I think for some of us, some days we're kind of caught in between those two extremes. Um, what kind of day are you having today? Is it that or that or something maybe, <laughs> something maybe in between? Well, this is because in my extensive getting ready for the children's sermon, <clears throat> I had to find something to kind of put the pictures on. So uh, here's... <laughs> I don't know if this is from the Drake Relays or what. <laughs> so, that's my little handle. So, just kind of a uh day? Not joyful? Not sad? Well, I was thinking about things that made me happy, um, and I have a list of different things, and maybe you have some that are special to you. But I listed a sunny day, a party or a social gathering, um, for you perhaps a new toy or app of some sort. This one's a big one for me. It's a puppy or a cat. Yeah, I have a 14-year-old black lab and he continues to amuse me. <laughs> Do you also? What age is yours? Six? Yeah. Oh. So how did they all get along? Pretty good? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, that can make us happy or, well, sometimes frustrated if things go on in the household. But <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you all ever watch those silly uh, pet videos sometimes? I get caught up in that sometimes. I just love to watch the antics of dogs and what they post sometimes. Uh, continue on, so the stuff that makes it happy for us. An ice cream cone. For me, it's Black Cat in Des Moines. A balloon, or spending time with a friend, or spending time with your family. 
Any other ones? Which, what's that? A cake is always good. Chocolate or vanilla or whatever. What's your favorite? Chocolate, yeah. That's always good. We don't think about calories when we have cake, though. Cookies? So what are some things that might make you sad? I listed some. Falling down and skinning your knee. Ugh. Making a bad grade at school. Feeling all alone can make you sad. Losing your favorite toy. Having an argument with your best friend. That's, that's always sad. And when someone says something to you that hurts your feelings, that, that's really tough, that makes you feel sad. Or when you miss someone, if they move away or they're not around. Any other things that you can think of that make you sad? Yeah? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because they're part of the family, right? Yeah, well, yeah. My, my brother has a black cat. He has a cat, and he's a little bit older. So the cat that was really cool was a Pitbull. Um, we named it White Cat that was inside of the attic. Because it had the little pink tail cap. But the tail cap was a coat that he would put on. Oh. So, oh, that's always tough. And even for a short time, you get attached. It was tough for my brother to get that name. Oh. What not? I love that name. <laughs> well, when you think about things that make you happy or joyful or things that make you sad, it's fairly straightforward. When something good happens to you, you're, you're happy and joyful. And when something bad happens, you're kind of sad. Do you think Jesus wants us all to be happy? Yeah? In the Bible, it says, Remain in my love. I have told you those things so that you will be filled with joy. It says, yes, your love will overflow. Now, that doesn't mean that bad things won't happen to us. Unfortunately, they do from time to time. But even when you're sad, you can have maybe just a little bit of joy in your heart because you know that Jesus loves you just the way you are, your authentic self. Don't ever forget that. Let's say a little prayer. You can repeat after me if you want. Dear God, we know that you love your son, Jesus, and that Jesus loves us. May we be filled with joy and love and spread that love to others. Amen. Thanks for coming up. See you later.
was ready to jump up. <laughs> Challenge words. Okay, I got it. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Loved ones, I ur urge Yodaya, I urge Sinta Chi to come to an agreement in, in the Lord. Yes, and I'm also asking you, loyal friend, to help these women who have struggled together with me in the ministry of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the scroll of life. Be glad in the Lord always. Again, I say, be glad. Let your gentleness show in your treatment of all people. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything. Rather, bring up all of your requests to God in your prayers and petitions, along with giving thanks. Then the peace of God that exceeds all understanding will keep your hearts and minds safe in Christ Jesus. From now on, brothers and sisters, if anything is excellent and if anything is admir admirable, focus on your thoughts on these things. All that is true, all that is holy, all that is just, all that is pure, all that is lovely, and all is worthy of praise. Practice these things, whatever you learned, received, heard, or saw in us, the God of peace will be with you. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O God. Our reading today from Philippians appears in the lectionary during what some traditions call ordinary time. The word ordinary originated with a Latin term, tempus per annum, which means time throughout the year. Ordinary time is counted time. The day after Pentecost is the starting point of one of several yearly liturgical seasons of ordinary time. It will bring us to the doorsteps of Advent. Yes, my friends, Advent is drawing near. It'll be here before we know it. But for right now, we're still in this kind of in-between season, and perhaps a good time to kindle again the flames of hope ignited on that day of Pentecost when worshipers first turned their feet toward the path of an ordinary journey. In the words of our reading, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. I don't know about you, but I need those words on an almost constant basis. We need to remember. We need that reminder. It's a sort of reminder that we should post on our bathroom mirror so that we can see it every single morning. We do need to create conditions that tend to our survival, and we need to cultivate and nurture joy. It's just darn hard sometimes to accomplish that in our lives, isn't it? For so many of us right now, it feels kind of fragile. Simply watch the nightly newscast. Here and there and everywhere, it seems like folks who are already hurting, already scared, already struggling to survive, are facing wave after wave of grief, and loss and despair. It's a hard time to display joy or rejoice when one is apprehensive for the safety, health, and well-being of both strangers and also those who are nearest and dearest to us, as well as for our very own selves. It's definitely a hard time to express joy. Alice Walker writes that those in communities of color have long claimed joy as a force of survival, a political force, an energy, a practice of living and persisting when evil forces in the world want you dead or deadened or gone. Resistance, she wrote, is the secret to joy. Well, Paul writes from prison to the church at Philippi, waiting, even longing, to be back with his beloved community. Paul is well into long, difficult days between his last visit to Philippi and when he will again feast with his friends there. 
The Philippian church, like Paul, is also suffering. The joy that energized that community when Paul first proclaimed the gospel in their midst is kind of waning down. So as sometimes happens during uncertain times, tensions have surfaced within that community. Paul writes that urgent dispatch to Euodia and Syntyche, church co-leaders who seem to be at odds with one another, or perhaps even with him. Both women have struggled beside Paul in the work of the gospel. Paul commends that work and counsels them and the rest of the community Keep on doing the things that you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. Despite the reality that his death may be imminent, Paul writes with calm confidence. He is at peace. So he insists during this time, until we see one another again, rejoice. Eugene Peterson writes in the message, the Bible in contemporary language, Philippians is Paul's happiest letter, and the happiness is infectious. Before we've read a dozen lines, we begin to feel the joy ourselves. The dance of words and the exclamation of delight have a way of getting inside us. He's writing this letter from prison as he faces death for preaching the gospel, for disrupting the empire and all its values. He's not writing on an especially good day when things are going well and he's surrounded by friends. No, he writes about joy springing from his knowledge of and relationship with Jesus the Christ. Peterson goes on to say, but happiness is not a word we can understand by looking it up in the dictionary or maybe Googling it in a more modern sense. In fact, none of the qualities of the Christian life can be learned out of a book. Something more of an apprenticeship is required. He sees it happening sometimes through association with a mentor or a faith community. Paul does not tell us specifically how to be happy. He simply and unmistakably is happy. And none of his circumstances would contribute to his joy. He wrote from a jail cell, his work was under attack by competitors, and after 20 years or so of hard traveling in the service of Jesus, he was probably exhausted and would have welcomed some relief. Peterson describes the source of Paul's joy. Christ is, among much else, the revelation that God cannot be hoarded. It is this spilling out quality of Christ's life that accounts for the happiness of Christians. For joy is life in excess of what cannot be contained within any one person. Joy is life in excess. Now that's an interesting way to describe joy. Paul, like any joyful person, does seem to overflow with a powerful need to share what he has. Maybe that is what generosity and evangelism and hospitality are all about sharing that overflowing joy, this life in excess. Peterson's version of Paul's words conveys this well, I think. He says, before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. William Countryman, in his book, Good News of Jesus, talks about that spilling out of joyful good news. He says it's communicated from one person to another by words, by action, by character, even by manner of life. It's communicated when one person catches another's faith and hope. He goes on to say it was inevitable that the good news should give rise to a community, one that was made up of people touched by it, responding to it, and learning how to live with it. To be faithful, this community also needs to stay open, to stay open along its borders, to stay in communication with those who do not identify with it so that that process of catching the good news can continue, end of quote. Given the state of the world that we live in, it would be understandable if the word joy, let alone spending time reflecting on it, sounds 
a little bit ridiculous, but yet our need, our craving, our hunger for joy is ever present and exposed. Reverend Anna Blydell in her blog, The Force of Joy in the Work of Liberation, writes about connecting with her college students during their first weekly gathering of the semester. She said, I was moved with joy just seeing their faces. We began with Sweet Honey in the Rock singing, Would You Harbor Me? We grounded ourselves and our semester in our dream, our vision, our commitment of being harbor for each other, of finding harbor, of being harbor for extended others. Would you harbor me? Would I harbor you? Would you harbor a heretic, convict, or spy, an exile or a refugee, a fugitive or a slave? These cannot remain rhetorical questions. We ask each other, how is it with your soul? These students are passionate and they are also tired. They're eager to learn, but they're also scared. They're doing good work, hard, needed work in the world, and they're struggling to find rest. They're seeking spirit and good trouble and restful, quiet, and a more livable world. What will it take to harbor each other? Our collective life depends upon it. Survival, joy, liberation, end of quote. Paul encourages that little flock of faithful folks. The words he uses may apply just as well to faith communities today, especially if they're feeling small and kind of overpowered by what surrounds them or pressured by a culture that preaches a very different message from the gospel. That feeling could also fit many of us as individuals in our lives at one time or another. Our hope, our optimism, our joy needs to embrace the full spectrum of human emotion. We can hold a tension between gratitude and grief, between love and hate, and between joy and anger without suppressing any emotions. I like how artist Austin Klein explained this tension in his work. He says, I am angered by so much in the world, but then I'm extremely curious about what the very opposite might be. I seek out the opposite of what angers me, and I try to amplify that in my work. Damon Garcia writes in In Flesh, we must think and feel whatever demands to be thought and felt within us, but we can choose a direction for our thoughts and feelings at the same time. We can feel and express every single one of our negative emotions while also transforming them into good work. I like how Bell Hooks describes this process. If we think of anger as compost, we think of it as energy that can be recycled in the direction of good. It is an empowering force. If we don't think about it that way, it becomes a debilitating and destructive force. So my friends, give yourself permission to rejoice and to find joy when you can grab it. Reverend Anna says this about it. Tender joy, resistant joy, disruptive joy, quiet joy, fierce joy. The joy of putting your hands in the dirt. The joy of a bursting ripe tomato still warm from the sun the joy of each breath drawn and exhaled, the joy of collecting in the streets, visioning and enfleshing a livable world, the joy of saying yes fully, the joy of saying no bravely, the joy of creating, the joy of practicing new patterns of relating, collective joy, our collective liberation. 
Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. It's sort of a mantra. You can tell yourself to rejoice and respond to any objection that rises up within you. Again, I will say rejoice. Repeat it as many times as you need to. But I can't rejoice yet, you may argue with yourself. Repeat again. Rejoice. Even now, rejoice. Thanks be to God. As we come to our time of offering, we remember that Jesus invites us to render to God the things that are God's. And so now trusting in God's infinite care, we gratefully present our offerings as we receive the morning offering. Let's pray together. Holy One, we often feel like we have to choose between remaining attuned to the pain of the world around us and keeping our spirits afloat. We find ourselves somewhere between being serious about our convictions and experiencing ease and delight. You, O oh God, promise us a better way. Teach us how to protect the full breadth of our humanity and that of our neighbors so that the full spectrum of life may flourish. Amen. Hymn number 575. Welcome one world family and 
Um, this is now our time for announcements as commissioning for the official term. This uh, is my second to last Sunday here. I will be with you next Sunday for one more time. And then Sarah, I think, finishes up the month. And don't forget the first Sunday in November, you'll be off to the Presbyterian Church to worship, correct? All right. <laughs> Do we have other announcements that need to be made? John? Uh, somebody gave me the DVD, The Jesus Revolution. Um, it's a movie that, I, that was kind of in the spirit of progressive Christian theology. I, I liked it. Um, I'm just kind of leaving it here in the library, so if anybody wants to check it out, they can. Um, it's on the podium right now, kind of out front. So, um, it's probably best for adolescents and adults. There's kind of some, some themes from that era, from the early 70s. So. Is that the same one that's on Netflix right now? I just saw it. It was on one of those streaming okay. services. Yeah. Um, we would like to host fellowship hour um, the next couple Sundays for John and Sarah's uh, last Sundays, and we may be welcoming new members next week. The deacons have kind of a packed thing going on right now, and a couple of them are out of town. So if you are willing to host fellowship hour, can you please let me know that and spread the word, and let's see if we can have some fun after church the next couple weeks. Nothing big, just casual. So thank you. Anything else? No? Well, my friends, may we rest in the peace that passes all understanding now and forevermore. The peace of the earth be with you. The peace of the heavens too. The peace of the rivers be with you the peace of the oceans too deep peace falling over you god's peace growing in you Sent forth by God's blessing, our true faith confessing, the people of God from this dwelling take leave. The seven